bleaching appears to be the most frequent resort or destination for people who want to enhance their physical appearance. This is closely followed by cosmetic surgery. Here in Nigeria, you can go into a doctor's office looking one way and a few weeks later, emerge with a completely different look. Physical enhancement is a thriving market and is showing no signs of slowing down because of the very high demand. But like with everything else, with the results of the aftermath, we have the beautiful, the not so good, the bad, and the simply outrageous. A large chunk of that is dominated by mostly substandard and poisonous concoctions and preparations which on a daily basis come through an inexhaustible conveyor belt from varying manufacturers who are profiting within the sector. But to break it down for us, we are now being joined by Dr. Osigbeme Awudu, a Chief Medical Director at Sholima Aesthetics and Lisa Clinic, and a consultant and general practitioner, certified aesthetic physician. Great to have you with us. Dr. Awudu, how are you today? I'm really good and very, very grateful to you to have me on. Excellent. <laughs> Dr. Awudu. I hope, the quality, I hope the quality is okay. Sorry? I hope the quality of the product. Oh, yeah. um, yes, we can hear you quite well. Dr. Okay, Awudu, you and I both know that one man's meat is another man's poison, especially yeah. in the world of cosmetic surgery, where we have some success stories, but we also have many situations whereby lives have been cut short and many others have been left deformed in pain or overly addicted. What works for wealthy celebrities in Hollywood may not work for wealthy politicians in Nigeria. Tell us today, how do you tailor your practice for the Nigerian market and for specific segments within the market? What data feeds into your decision for effective results? Well, again, you, you raise a, an extremely important um, point. And while we have this general boom in the industry uh, as a whole, cosmetic surgery, both invasive and non-invasive, um, I think what guides my practice is just standards. You know, um, when I set out to, when I came back from abroad to set up my clinic in Nigeria, it was purely on the basis of offering quality above quantity, above finance. Um, and I think that should be the guiding principle for any practitioner. It's about the quality of the work, which means safety of the highest standards, um, because while it's good to seek the outcomes of cosmetic surgery, obviously there are lots and lots of risk associated with it. So um, training is important. The level of experience is important. You know, um, gone are the days where we, we don't question our practitioners before a procedure. Please, those days are gone. You ask all the questions, do your research very well on who is going to be offering the treatment to you before taking a decision. It can be life-changing. It's important. Okay, doctor. Quickly transforming one's appearance is possible enough through plastic surgery. But it's also important to look past the aesthetics to the reality that surgery can be dangerous due to the nature of the procedure itself or because of some serious complications that can arise from that. So which plastic surgery in your books are the most risky? I hear BBL is one of them. And what are the complications that can occur as such, to achieve these results? What, what, what can go wrong? OK, so um, first and foremost, I'm not a plastic surgeon, but I still practice closely with a lot of them and I understand the space being an experienced medical practitioner as a whole. Like any other surgery, yes, you're right, some of the more complicated ones, I think you nailed it right there, BBL, especially the way it was done and practiced in the past. I mean, there are new, and new techniques that are trying to reduce that risk. It's, it is one of the most, if not the most complicated surgery in the world. Um, and why? Because the high, there's a very high risk of something called pulmonary embolism, which is where you get a blood clot traveling up one of the arteries or veins and going to the heart or the lungs. And um, it can, it's quite often quite, uh, it's quite often fatal. And if you juxtapose that with um, 
the state of our healthcare and its challenges, especially when it comes to emergency services, you know, getting to a patient quickly, um, that risk is further heightened significantly. Obviously, there are other risks involved, which is infection. It's a big problem. Um, things like organ damage, extremely important. Um, so the risks are very high. And yes, plastic surgery, in particular, the uh, things like BBL, would be uh, right up there amongst the most dangerous surgeries to undergo. So the aftercare is extremely important. You know, the surgery, like I said earlier on, picking the right surgeon is extremely important, but where you then get the follow-up care is even just as important because of, you know, good practices to prevent all these things. And then more importantly, to even detect when there's a problem that might need um, emergency attention. So it's very important the aftercare just as much as the surgery itself. We've heard of um, you know, bottle, bombs exploding and what have you. And then I'm curious, when you have this, especially the um, butt extension, can you still have injections in your butt, for instance? And are you allowed to sit on it or lie on it? Or how long is the process? How long are you supposed to not put any pressure on it before you know things get back to normal and then secondly please another one i have to ask do, what is the texture like do they feel the same i'm not a man so i don't know but i am curious because <laughs> i hear some of them as hard as rocks is that true i think again down to the, the procedure done and who does it where they place it i think um where it is placed underneath the muscle, um, it can pretty much be very normal, as it were. Um, if you place it above the muscle, it can. And again, it depends on how much of the fat, because fats are living, uh, living cells. And in, in the course of the surgery, um, the post-surgery, some may die, which could lead to lumpiness. So again, it depends on the surgeon, the way they where the fat is grafted from and you know, that is transferred, how much of it survives, the aftercare again that was provided, um, which would then lead to things like the diet, things that help the fat survive. The, be the better the fat that is transferred, the, the better the quality of the fat and the better the amount of them that survive leads to a better outcome. And it can be truly, honestly, natural feel, you know. Um, Less so with some of the more aggressive ones. There's a tendency for people to want a really massive extensive um, behind because of obviously social media and its impact. So you then tend to, that leads to more complications. Um, I think you will find the ones, and obviously there's an implication of cost. So most people want to get everything done in one treatment, whereas good surgeons will probably think about doing it in stages. So stage one, they'll do some, come back several months, and even a year later and, or two, and do it again. In terms of how long to, you know, um, you have to stay off your behind, it's, to be honest, it's as much as possible. So you could be looking at up to two to three months of avoiding of proper- not sit, Of not sitting on the chair? Three months Sorry? of not sitting on the chair? Well, you, you can use the, the, the um, What's the prosthetic? What's the word I'm looking for? Appliances, uh, equipment. Sorry, that you can sit on that provide a cushiony, okay. a less pressure. You know, again, it's all about trying to get as much of the fats to survive, so you don't lead to a lumpy, right. rough texture behind. Um, obviously, if freshly transferred fat is then compressed, you don't allow blood flow to circulate properly and then that could lead to more cell death. So I think the advice generally, and please I stand to be corrected, it's about two to three months, yes. Mm -hmm. Certainly for the first week to four weeks. So you see most people post-surgery for about a three, four weeks, they literally are off their bum or they're sitting on um, water balloons or air balloons um, rather than hard chairs and hard surfaces. But is fat the only transfer? What about silicon? Can you do silicon as well instead of fat? Oh, I think I think silicon is no longer being... Okay, I that's mean, how it is. Yeah, I mean, anybody who is 
who's transferring silicon now to be honest should be looked at the practice should so be what about those closely. that already had done it in the past those that have transferred silicon in the past do they now revisit the issue and change the silicon to facts well sometimes usually the people who have silicon by and large it's because they want a certain shape but they don't have the body habitus to come to carry it out you need to be a certain size to then be able to have the fats to be transferred so you find it's usually in people who don't have the size their, their natural habitus is a slim one and yet they still want that curvaceous um behind and that's where they use silicon but it, i know that for sure it's, out, it's not being practiced anymore um silicon is not being practiced mm -hmm. certainly not for the backside, um the gluteal area at all you and if you do have it in there i would strongly suggest you visit a good surgeon to to revisit taking it out mm -hmm. because there are multiple complications that can arise from the silicon being in there but there's some there's some that look like they're wearing pampas you know one is just yeah. tinted. Some of them look like they're wearing pampas. You know, I, you, you cannot resist the temptation. You just want to take a pin and just go boom to see whether it explodes. Do you understand? I mean, Absolutely. somebody walks in and her bomb appears five minutes later. So even, <laughs> even, social, as, even as doctors... Social media. No, it's, I know it's social, social media. media. But my, my point is that even as doctors, don't you ad advise them as to how extreme, you know, their limitations... Because a bomb, an extended bomb is supposed to flatter you. It's just a slight extension of what you're blessed with. But not that you come in and your bomb is arriving five hours later. I mean, you can put a tray of food at the backside. So, there, such we, extreme we measures, that, how do you advise yeah. it? That's why I started out by saying, please be careful who you go to see. A good surgeon that should tell you based on your body size you can you can you can comfortably carry this side the aim of beauty is to look as natural as possible and if you, there's a massive trend towards looking as natural as possible yes you can enhance a little bit um where you know most people can't tell but like i said it's the if, um period of social media and there was always somebody who for the right amount will provide the service and this does not just obtain in nigeria it's around the whole world that you know if you say no they'll go somewhere else but i think if more and more people think this is not um ideal because like you say it's it's to be honest not that attractive it's grotesque in my opinion personal yeah. opinion but one man's meat is another man's food. But you insist, tell you, you insist that they feel the same. Man. You insist and the texture. You insist the texture is the same. <laughs> I so as a well, man, no, as a man, no, you, you know, as a man now. Yeah, if you I touch, think based on dating people, that you no, know, yes, the yes, texture, yes. So as a doctor now, existing. are you telling me <laughs> that you can tell the difference between you can't tell the difference between extended bomb and natural you can't tell the difference as a doctor um, no no as a doctor i've i've, I've seen so many and i've, I've i don't no, know no. to say for as a man, for as a man not as a doctor as a man so the men can't tell the difference is what you're saying and to be honest with you if done properly no okay that's interesting if done properly. you see that's a very important word i use if done properly not really but it what about the silicon? Like what about if it's silicon can you tell the difference yes usually you should be able to you know but then i think it's about the, the the man himself what is he looking for you know um some people like it you know unnatural there there are people out there that just you know enjoy the the excessiveness of it the firmness of it near and near, not almost hard you know um the less rebound of it you know there's some people that just they, you know, like it, and I think there are people who would who keep chasing it. You know, mm. there's a market for everybody. Trust me. Interesting. Sad, sad as it says. There, as it is to say. there is a market for everyone, and you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier the dear importance of making sure that patients, clients ask the right questions when they're going in for cosmetic yes. surgeries. Yes. Not everyone requires medical intervention, but with the increase in fanatism across the world, there are people who watch TV, uh, on social media, as you mentioned, and also read the news and desire to look like the people they digitally look up to. 
Many times they want to restructure their appearance to reflect that of a role models. They also start to tell themselves, my skin is too light, my waist is too wide, my eyelids are rough, my boobs are saggy, and so on. What consultative feedback would you give to people who, with conditions that are simply slight variations from perceived optimal normalcy? Do you take in every client or do you guide some away from unneeded medical intervention, intervention and towards a position of increased self-esteem? So again, that's, that's extremely important and one of the reasons why we're here. You know, I think that's a true rise in what we call body dysmorphism, where people are just unhappy with their bodies and they have a tr unrealistic um, expectations of themselves because you can, you know, you can never be perfect. There's no such thing as a perfectly shaped human being. So as a professional, um, you evaluate every aspect of the patient, both physical, mental, um, and what you owe them is honest. So I personally, my clinic, I would say we turn away in terms of invasive procedures, minimal invasive procedures. I don't do invasive, but minimal invasive procedures. Um, part of it is just about education, counseling, um, you know, share, share and under, shared understanding with the patient as to what it is they seek and um, give them realistic expectations of themselves. And quite often being able to say no um, you don't need this procedure um, if if you accept, you know, with the, the, this little difference in chasing the correction, you could, you know, make things much worse. So, yes, you're constantly evaluating. That's why the consultation, the first consultation with the patient is extremely important. And we dedicate a lot of time to that, nearly sometimes 30 minutes an hour because you're trying to evaluate is this patient um is, is there a mental health issue here where no matter how much you try and correct physically it will not fix so you know you treat the patient as a whole the patient is holistic you know and um where you can and again you know in this day and age we have like i said minimal invasive and even non-invasive procedures you don't need to go under the knife you know so we are, there's so many Treatments, techniques, procedures we can do that are very that are ne next to nothing in terms of risk that can make a difference to patients' um, appearance. And so, going under the knife is not, a, you know, um, and that's even plastic surgeons as well are, are pushing that. And it only becomes necessary where it's uh, used where it's absolutely necessary. Had so we have a lot of things in our armory. Okay. To help again. Okay. Have you had examples of patients who actually take your advice? So, for instance, oh, don't get breast implants. Use a push-up bra, or you know, you know, for your skin, you know, try to get a better makeup shade. What are, can you give us an example of patients who have actually hacked into your advice and had success in the long run? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you, you know, patients are, you know, patients just want someone who can give them facts. It's not from a non-judgmental point of view, you know. And there are a lot of patients who may be seeking, you know, for instance, to take some excess loose skin away from certain parts after, or, you know, let me give a common example. Women post-pregnancy after having babies, sometimes, especially when you've had multiple um, births, you know, the, the, the skin and on their tummy from the expansion can sometimes come along what we call creepy, you know, so a bit wrinkly. Now, there are other many non-invasive procedures that rather than go have a tummy tuck, if it's not too bad, and there are some that do require tummy tuck, and then obviously they do need that. But there are some that you can honestly say, look, this is not too bad. You don't need the procedure of uh, tummy tuck to correct this. To correct diet, exercise, and with the use of some of these, like I said, non-invasive devices, one of them being... Um, radio frequency, you can correct, you know, significantly improve this this skin where you don't need to take on the risk of surgery. And, you know, more and more people are seeking that, okay. you know, and using surgery as an absolute, um, there's some things that surgery just is the answer. That's the truth. Okay. Um, but giving patients all the information for them to make an informed choice. Uh -huh. 
Okay, we'll take a break now, Doctor, because there's so many other questions I want to ask you. There's one that is particularly pertinent in my mind right now, and I'd really like to find the answer to that or the solution to that. So we'll take a break now at Perspectives, and we'll be right back with Dr. Ude. Hello, welcome back to Perspectives, where we were talking to Dr. Awude, and we want to continue again. My darling doctor, hmm? Hello. I'm not speaking on behalf of me, I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of women. <laughs> First, let's even start. What kind of, in, um, uh, what kind of um, surgeries can you do that are less invasive to improve one's appearance? Let's start with that. I have another question following that, but let's start with that first. Oh, I mean, I think the first thing would just be to advise on just good skincare. You know, um, the quality of our skin can be as powerful in presenting the side of us, and we want to, you know, youthful, radiant. So good quality skincare, good quality skin practices, simple things like facials, the right type of facials, chemical peels, which is where like a deeper kind of exfoliation um, down to things like, well, well, I'll say the number one non-invasive procedure done in the cosmetic space would be botulinum toxin injections, which helps with lines and wrinkles. Is that, um, bot is that Botox? Is that Botox? Fillers. Yes, it's popularly known as Botox, yes. That's yeah. the number one non-invasive procedure. But isn't that, that the one that makes your face look stiff? As in, you don't have any wrinkles in your forehead anymore, and you just well, yeah. you just look like you're permanently su surprised. I hear that's okay, how so that makes you look. So that, yes, yes, that's what you're talking about. But that's unfortunately down to poor technique. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, so okay, with so the right it's, technique, you know, you you probably wouldn't be able to tell that someone's had uh, botulinum toxin. They just look more relaxed. Yes, the lines and wrinkles around the face are smoothened out, which gives us a more youthful appearance. But I've been told that if you don't do it as often as you're, as you're meant to, your face will end up looking like a plastic, <laughs> plastic pure water, empty plastic pure water <laughs> sash, sash. <laughs> <laughs> We get that a lot, but that's, is that, that's, is that true? No, that's not true. No, because we I've seen people that have done Botox, and I can right. tell when they have just done it and when they are due to do it. <laughs> okay, you have close friends then who you are you probably <laughs> monitoring. I'm not, names, friends, I'm not calling names, I'm not calling names, I'm just saying. <laughs> Maybe it's your colleague in the theater, in the in the audience there with you. No, but so how often colleague. how often are you supposed to now do this Botox? She's too young. Your colleague. What does she know about Botox? She's no too Botox. young. She's half my I'm age. Teasing. I'm teasing. She's I'm half teasing. my age. She doesn't need it. I am. <laughs> Botox, Botox, Botox done correctly. I mean, it's it's the number one procedure for a reason. Yeah, but how often? How often is Botox necessary? How often is it necessary? Usually, we would say uh, when you just start out, usually it should last about three to four months. So in the first year, you should do it about three times. But then what you find is the second year, because it's had the effect of smoothing out the wrinkles. Most people then tend to need to have it maybe once in uh, twice a year. Yeah, but where, in, where do you inject? Where do you inject in your faces for for your face for Botox? So it depends on what you, you can inject any part of the because face. I remember the most common areas. Some areas are too sensitive. Areas. No, sorry, go on. I remember you said some areas are too sensitive for injections. So where do you now? Is it your forehead so, and? So the commonest areas are around to smoothing out the, the wrinkles of the forehead what we call the crow's feet, which is the sides of the eye um, around here, because, you know, with our expression, especially us, we, uh, we that live in a warm, sunny climate, we tend to squint a lot. So we, if you find that people have um, wrinkles over there, they can be quite deep even when, and they give them this angry look, um, even when they're, they're expressionless. So, that's usually the most common thing we use it for. We can use it to soften a feminine, you know, create a more feminine look to females who have um, excessive muscles and uh, their masseter muscles. But is it only is it only men and women that can, men don't do Botox? Oh, my men do Botox. I've had Botox. Oh, really? Where? Yeah. 
Where? Yes, I've had it. No, where? Yeah. Where? Show it on your body. Where? Where? Your... <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. It's done properly. Um, I, I no, but I can see. I can see, see some lines. I can see some lines in between your eyebrows. Correct. So again, like I said, everybody's different. I don't do it to completely erase and create that frost frozen look. Okay, to I make it look more natural. I want to soften. You can do it to soften the look, to soften the lines, to give a natural look. Yeah, but you can't do um, anything, you can't do anything on the neck though. You can't do anything no, on the neck. Absolutely, we can use we actually use Botox in the neck. Then. Oh, you can. What we call yes. It's a, wow. If you see, there's some women who have what we call the Nefertiti neck, where they get because of the bands, the the tendon here, the, the ligament. Sorry. But how is we this? Can, how is this different from acupun acupuncture? Oh, so it's totally different because acupuncture is a totally different style of medicine. But is it the, is it the same? Injecting something to paralyze the muscles. Is it so the same result? Is hmm? it the same? Is it the same result? Acupuncture. Oh, no. And... no, 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 no. Acupuncture okay. is a Chinese medicine. They use it as medicine mm -hmm. to treat certain conditions. You okay. can that works on meridians and. Uh, Another question I want to ask. I think my, my yeah. co-host, you should close your ears. You're too young to, to ask this question. Maybe when you're 20 years older. Another question I want to ask. <laughs> what is this big O injection? <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting question. What is big O oh injection? Goodness. What is that? Because, I mean, you, you've, you've, I've, heard, I've heard of it. What is it? <laughs> I can't, I, it's a procedure I do quite a bit. In Some my say it's a lifesaver. I don't know how true that is. So please, no, I say explain it quite it's, a bit. Please explain. It's, a, it's, it's another armory in our toolbox for patients who have, it's, it's called the O-Shot because it helps increase the quality and intensity of one's orgasm. Um, mm -hmm. We take this, um, something called PRP. From where? Which is plasma. Where do you take it from? From your blood so it's taken from your blood yeah okay. and we spin it down and get something called growth factors so it's it's platelet rich plasma and we inject it in certain parts of the uh, female genital um tract to then create because the prp causes what we call neovascularization it's got growth factors, it's rich in growth factors. Growth factors are the building blocks of arteries and nerves. So you can really significantly improve, you know, because you improve the nerve supply to that area, you increase the blood flow to that area, and um, you can significantly improve the quality of orgasms that patients then get. But are you saying that this has, are you saying this has to be done the same way you do Botox, like every three months you go to, you go to recharge your battery? So to speak, <laughs> my co host, is this something you want to do? Is this something you would consider? No, I'm advising. I'm, ad I'm, ad I'm, ad I'm, ad I'm not the only one watching. So, so, so quite often, in the oh beginning, you, you, you could do twice, maybe one, and then second one three months later. Usually after that, once a year, if you so choose. Some people achieve theirs on the, after the second one and they're good. So it's not the same, no. Oh, I'm, look, Doctor, I would say you are really, you are really educating us today, and it's good to yeah. learn. I'm yes. good. It's I'm good glad. to learn. Because, because I think most of us, women need, purpose. yes, women need my to know their bodies. Okay. Have so, Doctor, I would let's, let's delve. Right. right. Yeah, go on. Let's delve into bleaching a bit. A 2002 ah. study of 450 traders in Lagos, consisting of 252 females and 96 males, concluded that almost 80 percent of the participants used skin lightening products. This led to a conclusion that many Nigerian women and men were actively seeking lighter skin. In more recent times, the brown girl magic melanin movement has strengthened the genuine beauty in skin color variances with a deeper appreciation for melanated skin. Many people stopped using the words dark or black to represent Africans. Beyonce sang the powerful words, brown skin girl skin just like pearls. That powerful song resonated amongst young women globally. And in my circle, we are absolutely in love with our skin color and we, sp we protect every drop of our melanin. But you see patients on a daily basis. We need to know, is the melanin love gaining widespread appreciation? 
Has skin bleaching and lightening reduced somewhat across Nigeria or specifically within your practice? You touched on a very sensitive topic for me. Um, when I, one of these was one of my, I was almost on a mission when I first came back to Nigeria with my practice to try and correct this. It's a big pandemic proportions. Um, where, but you know, I, I, the longer I've stayed in Nigeria and practice, I, my, my viewpoint is, is somewhat more empathetic in the sense that information was not available. You know, um, that's a, it's a myriad of topics in the sense that everything geared towards back then, social, you know, what was in the, in the media space was light is better being black and then on top of that we live in a very hot climate our skin type darkens easily um every mark or spots and we didn't have enough knowledge about use of sunscreens we didn't have enough people to guide so that led to this boom of bleaching you mm -hmm. know to try and both correct then also obviously to, because then it was thought light is bright and like you rightly pointed there's a shift I must tell you, it's a very slow shift, but at least we're shifting. Where in the five, you know, eleven years ago, 10, 12 years ago, we it, we, we were not shifting. You know, there was no understanding of um, or appreciation of having your brown skin being beautiful. The what word will change from where where it started many years ago to light and bright. We no longer use that. We're talking about radiance, and radiance has mm -hmm. no color. You know, you could be brown and radiant, dark, black, skin type, as black as ebony. And, you know, mm. but the truth is there's still a huge drive for light. And anyway, skin. anyway, doctor, you know? we are yet to come back again to you. We haven't finished. When you talk about skin lighting, I mean, I have to admit, I'm one of, I'm, I'm one of those. So we need to <laughs> find out more about this and look for a way that it can be done better. So we're going for a break now in perspectives and we'll be right back in just a moment. But in but extension to you know, but now we're talking about skin bleaching, right? Um there, there are some experiments that they say they call it skin lightening. Do you understand? As opposed to outright bleaching. And then you see some where they already have black patches and what have you. And depending on the kind of expense, depending on how expensive your product is, is some of them are subtle growths. But what I find most amazing is that they actually have injections that you can take for the skin bleaching. And in that case, what are the side effects of this? I mean, how safe is it? Okay, so I think straight away you're talking about the rise of something called glutathione injections. Um, glutathione is a naturally occurring um, amino acid in our body. It's an antioxidant. We've used it in medicine for many, many years, especially when we're dealing with people who um, overdose on paracetamol and certain neurological complications. Um, but over the last, say, 15, 20 years, you know, more and more people are using it because as a side effect of injecting one, it was noticed that people's skin got lighter. So that, this is now the trend. They came out with tablets, which didn't really work because of our stomach acids, except you get the type that what we say the, um, that's coated, what we say the lysosomal coating to help protect. That gives some benefits. Um, but by and far and large, the best way to gain with it, um, to get the skin lightening is injectables. Now, the truth is, it is relatively safe, to be honest with you. It's, it is very safe as an antioxidant. But to get the skin lightening side of it, it's not truly, the, there are not enough studies to, sh to really show us the benefits or adverse effects of it. There's some poorly done studies that showed really dangerous side effects in terms of liver damage, um, spleen, damage to the spleen and pancreas, but to be honest, they were really poorly done studies. So we don't have enough knowledge about them, and that's the honest truth. But what about the long-term side effects? 
What about the one where you have to get into, you have to have a bath? They put you in some, in some, um, so that's just nonsense. That's dangerous. That's just pure acid. You know, some people are you serious? Yes, and that's that's dangerous. I mean, you know, and it's literally acid peeling off the skin, and um, quite often you do develop terrible body scars. So that's a such places should be closed down straight away. I Even with the thyroid injections, the truth is, uh, at the healthy, what we call six, safe dose of 600 milligrams to 1,200 milligrams, you don't get that much in terms of skin lightening. They really push it to the 3,000, 4,000 milligrams, wow. you know, where to get the side effect of skin lightening. And it's temporary. And that's the problem. So you inject yourself. Yes, if you go with the high doses, relatively safe, you will get some degree of toning of the skin. The quality of the skin tends to improve. That's true. In terms of the uh, complexion of it, you can get some degree of toning. Um, but, you know, what's the point? The minute you stop it, it reverses. So it's something you keep exactly. having to do. Mm -hmm. you know, so you so it's, something, to. it's something that you have to do for life, basically. If you yes. started skin toning or skin bleaching, it's actually something that you do till you die. Look at that. Or you accept that this is not, you know, especially if you're doing the un truly unhealthy ones, you know, you know, because... A lot but what of are the healthy ones? Unhealthy ones. What's, what's so is creams, healthy, instance, what is healthy own, skin, well, what, skin bleaching? What are the healthy ones? So the healthy ones are only your skin. You know, things like I talked about exfoliation. By using exfoliating products, you know, something like um, lactic acid. It's, uh, it's made from milk. You know, you, you can have that in a product and in the right dose, it gently exfoliates the skin. So it removes your dead skin cells and leaves a more healthy, radiant skin, especially if you then support it with good moisturizers, emollients. So that you can do to improve your skin quality. Will it take you two, three shades more? No. Um, but will it give you a more healthy, radiant, less uh, patchy skin? Yes. So you're talking, so you know, you're talking Queen of Venus. Yeah. When you say milk, are you talking Queen, Queen, of, Queen, of, Queen of Venus kind of bath? Queen of Venus and Murad. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry to call names, but all these, you know, there are many names. They are even called carrot soap. Organic is the buzzword now. Organic. I don't use, I don't bleach, I don't turn, I use organic. You know, mm -hmm. it's, most of them contain... But as a doctor, as a doctor, would you mm -hmm. advise... As a doctor, would you advise skin and skin bleaching or skin toning, however they call it? Would you advise any of your clients to go through that? To be honest with you, what I what we try to do is tell people. I, I I'm, I'm like I said, I'm empathetic because people we have marks that leave dark spots. You know, people have had chicken pox, and in our skin, injury of any kind, acne, it leads hyperpigmentation. So that's not your normal skin. That we, I would support in correcting by giving the pigmenters you know, things to help correct the hyperpigmentation. But what I'm against is having your healthy, normal skin and making it abnormal. That's, that's not we medicine. Do. We shouldn't be doing that. We can make people radiant. We can, you know, make people Absolutely. soft, you know, smooth, improve their texture, correct pigmentation disorders. But where you've got nice, blessed, God-given, healthy skin, and you want to go take it, I mean, that's a bit to each his own. But, you know, I try to dissuade people because quite right. often you run into problems. If I know that we can safely do it, I, you know, I'll support people in doing it. And they, they, we, to be honest, in dermatology, we're constantly, in cosmetic medicine, we're constantly searching for that holy grail. It's in every good com medical aesthetic conference is talked about how do we improve because it's being done you know let's there's an acceptance that this is being done if we the safe practitioners are not providing it people would be forced to go to you know it's like during the days when alcohol was made illegal and they were still being sold they were just driven underground to the place where it was not regulated on safe practices were happening so you know we recognize that this is not going away if we, the practitioners, can provide the service and provide it in a safe, healthy way, then why not? Right. That's my standpoint. Doctor, would you? Know, you? To each his own. Everybody has the right to determine what 
makes them happy, what helps them get through the day. Absolutely. And my, my space is to provide it for you safely. Yeah. Dr. Awudu, with the widespread increase yes. in plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, we have seen an increase in budged cases. Many women are, and men too, are increasingly unhappy, not only with their skin, but with their bodies. They go to quack, is it quack? Quack you know, doctors. Quack doctors yeah. who, you know, yes. just do whatever, perform whatever two for on one. them. <laughs> two for one. <laughs> Buy one they are increasingly two. having diseases, infections. I mean, let's not talk about how budged people have gotten over the years. I'm someone who's very passionate about Nigerian citizens and what we're doing together as government to protect our people. Is there a regulatory body and how effective it is in weeding out quack doctors, in protecting citizens and in increasing awareness of the side effects and the huge risks and the dark sides of cosmetic surgery? Hmm. Mm, that's a tough question. You know, the, the honest answer is um, we're not doing enough. If, if there is such a body, it's not, being, it's not doing enough. That's the truth. So people are not being held to be accountable. And this is not just in plastic surgery. I think it's across the whole medical space of Nigeria. There's a lot more we can do. Um, but it takes not just, you know, as a body, the Medical and Dental Council, as a body, can do better. But I think as a whole, it needs government initiatives. You know, the government needs to then provide the environment for such bodies to then um, act. You know, they're, they're too far, um, con there are no consequences. You know, they're not enough in terms of consequences um, for poor, poor management by practitioners, let alone non-practitioners. I mean, we're even struggling to deal with practitioners and holding them accountable to their quality of, to the quality of care. But you do have but, a collective you know, it's body. A it's such a unregulated space. You have, a collect, you have a collective body that parameters have to be put in place for you to be a member of that body, don't you? Correct. Well, we do insert, there, there is one for the surgeons. But in cosmetic medicine, there isn't one as that now. It's one we're looking at, and a few dermatologists who practice cosmetic medicine, uh, myself and a few other really good doctors are, are really um, pushing, trying to work on mm -hmm. to come together yeah. and pro provide that body because there are too many. Thank you so much, doctor. For all right now. Thank you so. Yeah, so many people injecting. Thank you so much, doctor. I mean, we look forward to a body that we can be safe with, that we can be guaranteed that they will bring their best and give us the results that we desire. And if they go wrong, that we can sue and be compensated Absolutely. for any damages. Thank you so much, Dr. Awadu. We Thank really you. enjoyed this. You have really given us a few eye openers. And that's all we have time for today. You've been watching Perspective here on Arise News. And remember, life is a learning curve. I am Ruth Osime. And I am Ola Torreira, Majekudumi Oniru. Thank you for watching Perspectives today. Goodbye for now. See you next week. <laughs>